Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Fontana with the Ohio Soybean Council. And on behalf of our education uh, platform, Grow Next Gen, I want to welcome you to this field trip today with Consolidated Grain and Barge. Uh, Grow Next Gen is an education platform for teachers and students. I encourage you to go to grownextgen.org to see all the good information we have there. And we're happy that on behalf of our 25,000 soybean farmers in the state of Ohio, we thank you for your participation today. Uh, just some housekeeping notes. I want to make sure uh, that you'll know how to interact with us today. If you're joining us on Zoom, you'll note that the chat is turned off today. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask us questions. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please note that the live chat is turned off. So please just sit back and enjoy the program. Uh, our moderator today is Heather Bryan. Heather is with educationprojects.org, our partner on Grow Next Gen. And uh, we hope you enjoy the program. Uh, with that, I want to thank Consolidated Grain and Barge for hosting us today. And I will turn it over to Mike Hogan, who is the Corporate Origination Manager for Consolidated Grain and Barge. Take it away, Mike. Great. Thanks a lot, Tom. Really appreciate being here and uh, allowing CGB to participate in uh, such a really neat, cool, and educational event for that. Um, we hope to take you guys around our uh, Consolidated Grain and Barge facility in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, this one is called the Riverside Facility. And uh, helping us along our journey is going to be, I think, two very key and important teammates for that. Uh, the first one is going to be Scott Theobald. He is the Group Origination Manager uh, for uh that facility and actually a group of facilities within that area and range. And he's just gonna be a fountain of knowledge for helping guide us around this. Uh, the other person that we wanna, and it's probably our, our really our tour guide for today is uh, Doug Favor. And uh, he is the uh, CGB Riverside uh, facility manager. And he will be kind of taking us on this journey, et cetera. But as you can imagine, Doug's uh, in, entire job is making sure that the facility is, is well taken care of and performing as it should for both our incoming producer customers, uh, as well as making sure all the processes that we need to move grain from basically the truck uh, into what we call our house or grain bins, and then eventually out into a barge, rail car, or maybe another truck uh, to transport it to wherever it needs to go. Uh, that all falls under Doug's um, kind of responsibilities and guidance at this point. So it's uh, it's a pretty interesting job, and we hope you guys enjoy the, uh, uh, the view as we go through our facility here with things. Uh, so I think, you know, as we kind of move around here, um, you know, the, probably the first thing that we want to look at as we go is what happens when a truck pulls in uh, to the CGB facility. And from there, usually the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to go and it's going to become, uh, it's going to be probed. In other words, what is the grain and the quality of the grain that is within that truckload? And as you can see, Doug is, is hanging out up there. Uh, he is in our, what we call probe shack. And uh, Doug, maybe you want to take a little bit here and uh, explain what happens uh, during the probing process when somebody runs into the CGB facility. Uh, yes, when they pull into the facility, they pull into the probe and they get probed four times to get a representative sample of what type of grain is on the truck grade wise. It comes into the probe stand, it comes into these boxes over here and then goes through a splitter and gets broke down in different percentages. And then brought over here, this is corn, not soybeans, unfortunately, but we weigh it to find out how much it is. And then we can pick through the damage, which would be anything with soybeans. And then we do the splits and also FMs, which is foreign material. Goes through a moisture machine and we get the moisture test weight and the temperature of the grain. So Scott, maybe tell us a little bit about why the, those grade factors are important when um, trying to figure out exactly what's in a load of grain. We yeah, try to a, segregate, oh, sorry, Scott. No, that's fine. There's a base grade that is uh, determined by the Federal Grain Inspection Service. So all grade factors are determined by the Federal Grain Inspection Service and there's discounts if the grain that we're receiving falls outside of those guidelines. So for example, on soybeans, the base test weight is 54 pounds. So that would mean 54 pounds in a bushel. The moisture would be 13%. 
FM 1%. And as Doug mentioned, FM4 material would be anything like sticks, stones, pods, anything other than soybeans. So you're only allowed 1% of that. And damage, uh, which could be field damage or damage done in the farmer's bin, you're allowed 2%. So as the, as the probe stand takes that sample, breaks it down and determines how the sample compares to the federal grain inspection guidelines, then we will apply discounts to it if they're beyond those baseline minimums. So Scott, could you help us to understand just a little bit better for students that are out there about um, the components that you just discussed? So if you were a farmer and you brought in some grain that did not meet those minimum requirements, what would you do with that grain as it comes into your facility? We have the ability to a certain extent, we don't have a lot of bins. Some facilities have a lot of bins where they can segregate commodities based on those factors. So for mm -hmm. example, you might have a bin that has high moisture grain in it. You might have a bin that has high damage grain in it. And that grain can be used for blending at loading periods. Um, the farmers uh, want to get the grain moved because it doesn't do them any good to keep it on the farm. So when they'll bring it into us, even if there's discountable factors with it, they'll probably uh, dump it at our facility and then return being willing to accept the discounts. Discounts are not huge. Um, usually in a settlement of uh, damage, for example, probably the highest discounts we would take would be five to six cents a bushel. Uh, foreign material comes off the net weight of the load. So basically you're just not gonna get paid for the stick stones, pods and that kind of stuff. And test weight, uh, very few discounts for test weight. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like um, farmers in general are really bringing high quality grain into your facility and that is being used around the world. So we're really excited to be here because as you can see, um, there looks like they're testing those factors right now in the lab on there. And I believe that Doug is in the process of moving out to where they would be loading a barge for us to see that live as well. But just to kind of take it a step back for students, let's just discuss a little bit about the importance of what you are doing by helping to transport grain um, from farms in Ohio down um, eventually to make it to the port in New Orleans and then eventually, you know, later on further out. And so just how much grain do you think that you guys are moving, you know, um, annually? You know, that's a lot of grain for students to just kind of wrap their heads around just a little bit. Certainly. Try to put a little perspective on it. A uh, One bushel of soybeans weighs 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the grain that comes to our facility is delivered in semi-trucks. And most of those trucks will have approximately 1,000 bushels on them. So about 60,000 pounds of soybeans on every truck that comes in. In uh, a normal year, the busiest time for the river, which uh, for the export system is usually December through March. That's when we dump the most trucks. Um, and on a barge, we can put 50,000 bushels on a barge. So we can put props, excuse me, 60,000 bushels. We can put approximately 60 semi loads on one barge. A good percentage of the soybeans raised in the U.S. do go for export. And so facilities like this facility here in Cincinnati uh, are loading barges to get on the river system. The river system is the most efficient uh, system we have for moving grain to the Gulf compared to trucks. Um, you can imagine it's probably a 15-hour truck, truck ride from Cincinnati to the Gulf, so very inefficient. Uh, unit trains uh, do go to the Gulf with a vast percentage of grain that uh, – comes to our facility going export all goes by the river system. Perfect. I know we have a slide that shows a lot of the vessels that you were just discussing to help students get a better idea of what uh, the what amount or volume can be placed on each particular uh, vessel. So whether it would be truck or barge, um, and then eventually to a larger tow, you know, they can really see how much grain is being moved down the rivers. Um, we do have a question from Big Walnut High School. Students are really interested in different career pathways within agriculture. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a lot of different careers. So, for example, for you, Scott, or you, Mike, uh, can you help us understand a little bit better your educational pathway to the jobs that you're taking part in today? Sure, I think we can we can definitely do that. So when we think about you know some of the careers that we have, we have a couple just different buckets for folks to look in. Um, one, we kind of have those office and back office type of jobs. 
uh, a lot of those involve things uh, financial, so accounting, um, trading, uh, commodities are traded, Chicago Board of Trade, for example. Um, very, very interesting types of, of career paths from that standpoint. Um, sales types of jobs, right? So there are folks that they have to interact with our producers uh, to be able to understand what their crops are and what it's going to take for us as a company to buy those crops at, at some point in time and bring it in. So they've kind of formed that sales and customer service type of roles. Um, so a lot of the things that, you know, th those are kind of what you would consider the, the office, back office, white collar type jobs. There's a lot of other jobs too that also involve your hand. So something like what Doug's doing, he, he certainly has an office, does a lot, but man, he is working with his hands an awful lot as you can see, making sure that all of that equipment and all of the uh, structures on the facility are maintained to the best of their ability. He and his crew and his team uh, are charged with doing that. So there's a lot of planning and paperwork that happens to make sure the right things are being done, uh, as well as the actual execution of doing those jobs. Uh, then there are all sorts of other things that we just don't think about a whole lot. Uh, as you can tell, we operate a uh, physical facility. So careers in safety and environmental and all of those things also come up. So uh, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's not just people think, boy, I have to get my high school education, go to a ag oriented college, and then come up with an ag degree. Um, you know, that's certainly a path. Um, I, I would go on to say that, you know, even somebody such as myself, uh, I came more from just a financial background and didn't even have a, uh, a personal farm background with that. So there, there's a lot of different routes to get here. So I would say, even if agriculture isn't something that you are uh, intimately familiar with right away or even know a whole lot about, um, guess what? That's most professions when, when somebody goes from uh, kind of a student into a professional career path on that. So there's lots of different routes, lots of different ways to get here, especially if somebody's involved in agriculture already. And even if they're not, that is definitely not a roadblock or a hindrance at this point. Thank you. So One thing, Heather, I, I just... Oh, yeah, please, Scott, go ahead. No, you're perfectly I just might add on to what Mike said, too, that, you know, agriculture, the one thing about a career in agriculture is everybody wants to eat uh, worldwide. And so careers in agriculture, like he said, you can come from any background and still find a good, uh, good long-term career in ag. So I would urge students, even if they're not thinking about going to an ag school, consider uh, some of the jobs that he mentioned about, because uh, it can be a very satisfying career. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I'm enjoying watching today right now is that Doug is walking outside. So he has the opportunity to be outside and inside, you know, and to see a lot of different aspects. Um, but I think right now he's kind of, he, they look like they're loading a barge, but I think there are some things we can talk about before we get to the barge, if I remember correctly. So uh, we saw a truck come in and get probed so that they could do the test um, of the four factors of so moisture, test weight, damage, and foreign material before that truck has to move off of there. So what is that next step? So after we leave the scale house, where does the truck go to help get the grain into the CGB system? Once the truck has been probed and the grade has been established, he'll go to one of our scales. And at this facility, we have three different scales and each of the scale has a dump pit with it. And that's basically uh, a hole in the ground going over to a leg, which will elevate the grain to the top of the facility. So the picture we're seeing now, a truck is pulling onto a scale. We want to get his full weight before he dumps. And then he will dump and get the, this particular hopper truck is emptying a load of soybeans. So it's going down into the pit that we referred to. And it'll, a uh, conveyor will take it over and it'll go to the top of the elevator on what is called a, a bucket elevator. And that's basically just a bucket that picks up the grain. It's attached to a belt and goes to the top of the elevator and dumps it at the top to where it's put into one of the storage bins that we have. Okay, cool. So just, just to kind of recap there, it looks like you're, you have a semi there that's dumping about a thousand bushels of grain or so into that pit. And then it's getting onto the conveyor systems that I think we're seeing on the second camera right now. So that's a lot of storage that I see at your facility, but you're moving grain every single day. So roughly how much grain can you store on your facility at a time, you know, as you're in the process of, you know, continually moving it down the river? This particular facility, uh, Riverside, we have 1.6 million bushels of storage. Um, the two big white, that two big white bins that we saw just a minute ago, are 500,000 mm -hmm. bushels each. And then the silver bins that we saw where the truck was dumping, those are 100,000 bushels each. And each one of them contains a different commodity. 
since we do both corn and soybeans at this facility, and we do identity preserved crops too, which are non-GMO crops, uh, there's various bins for various types of grain too. Okay, perfect. When you're, um, so when you are moving grain um, from the trucks into the system, and then it's temporarily held before you move it out a, an alternative way, and I know you use both rail and barge there um, within CGB, um, it, you know, it just, it just seems really cool to me to watch it all happen. I'm wondering, um, you know, today you mentioned that you have a particular uh, type of soybean that's come in. So could you talk to us a little bit about the type of soybeans that you're moving today um, at CGB? Sure. Uh, the barge that uh, we'll see being loaded here in a little bit is a identity preserved barge. And what I mean by that is it's, there are soybeans that are non-genetically modified. Uh, there's been a lot of science going into soybeans and corn over the years for genetic modification to uh, traits that are uh, built into the beans and corn, drought tolerance, weed tolerance, and different things like that. There's a premium in the market for stuff that is not genetically modified. Certain countries of the world do not want genetically modified crops. So we have producers who will raise these, uh, we call them non-GMO uh, crops. They get paid a premium. They're isolated in our facilities and put on specific barges to go to the Gulf uh, and are handled down there much the same way. They're uh, separated from all the generic uh, grain that goes to the Gulf and uh, loaded on a vessel to go overseas. And pretty good premium to the producers. An example on uh, non-GMO soybeans, it's about $1.60 per bushel premium over the regular price to raise non-GMO beans. Good. Well, I think that if... Um... Is Doug out there with the gimbal? How are they doing out there? Looks oh, like we're, awesome I'm connected. Just, are you connected? I hear you, but I just don't see you. So yep, she's working on getting the camera connected right now. It's been dropping back and forth. Okay. Well, maybe we can go ahead and show some of that secondary footage we were able to take, um, Alex, that talks about the loading there. Um, so the looks, students looks can like see we're back that. on. Oh, are you back on? Perfect. Yep. All right. Well, tell us what's going on out there, Doug. So right now we're on the second half of our barge. We sink down the first half and then we switch, we literally switch halves of barges and then we sink it down to a required draft, whether it's by the barge line, whether it's for specific bushel amounts they request or however it goes that way. And we move the barge up and down. We have some haul cables over here that are, they go around to the two cells and then connect in the middle and that moves our barge up and down. We have other winches and other locations that keep it abreast, they're called breasting winches. So they keep the barge pulled in so we can load. So help me understand, like why is that barge covered out there? I mean, it's kind of interesting that there's just some holes that you're filling into, right? And then the rest of it looks like you seal it up pretty tight. Why do you need to do that? Uh, the covered barges, that is for things that are being shipped up and down the river that need to stay out of the rain, anything mm -hmm. like that. They wanna keep animals away from it. There's other products that do go up and down the river that don't have covers on them, but all the grain barges that we load, they do have covers. Okay. And so you said that approximately 75,000 bushels are on one barge, if I remember correctly. Is that what Scott had told us earlier today? And so yes. how many barges do you typically put together on the Ohio River as a tow to move towards the Mississippi River? Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the Ohio River has 15 barges. Okay, that's really cool. So just think about that, guys, 75,000 bushels per barge, and you have 15 of those in one barge tow. Um, and I, in, I'm sure you have to stack them up in there. So maybe they're stacked three wide, maybe. So perhaps then five deep. That's quite a load going down the river. Do you have to worry about the height of water in the river, in the Ohio River, as you're moving them down to the Mississippi? Yes, we do. It really impacts us a lot. The river is actually coming up 13 feet from today until Tuesday next week, I believe. So it is going to jump. Just from the safety side of things, that's what affects us the most. But just wear and tear on equipment, accessing the barge, getting on and off, things like that are definitely do affect us. Okay, thank you. About how long will it take for you guys there at your facility, Riverside, to help to load up one of those 15 barge tows before it can move down the river? Uh, we can load a barge in about two and a half hours here. So we just add the math there and that's how long it would take us to get 15. 
All right. Awesome. So it does take quite a while, you know, more than, you know, so I'm just trying to add that up in my head. So like seven and a half hours for just, and then times five. So more than a day almost to get that moving down to the Mississippi river. Okay. That's a lot of grain all in one time for sure. Um, we do have a couple of uh, questions from Andrew DeLong. They are curious, um, Scott, about how much does it cost to ship that grain on the barge? You know, so if it's if it's leaving Riverside and you, you have a 15 barge tow, you know, is it is, you know, how much is that cost to get it all the way down to New Orleans eventually? Now, you don't have to be exact about it, but you can just kind of give us a roundabout figure for shipping. Sure. The uh, barges that we have, CGB does not own the barges. So we basically rent a barge for a trip of grain from Cincinnati to the Gulf. There's a market that trades every day, just like the commodity prices in the barge freight market. The base barge uh, freight out of Cincinnati to the Gulf is called 100% of tariff. That's 14 cents per bushel. And that trades every day. Right now, freight's trading about 500%. So 14 cents times five, uh, 70 cents roughly. But we did see this last summer when... Uh, there was uh, sh uh, short uh, water levels in the river and stuff. Barge freight actually traded as high as 3,000%. It's the highest that it's ever traded in history. So it was over two, almost $3 a bushel for every bushel that we would ship. So depending on 70 cents a bushel today versus $3 a bushel four months ago, um, that had a big impact on the price that our farmers were receiving for their grain too. Oh my gosh, I guess so. I didn't realize that that was what uh, the difference was this particular year. So we did have uh, this question again from Angie Williams at Avon High School about just what you're talking about. So how low, for example, on the Mississippi River, um, can you, you know, does it, how low can it get to, forgive me, before you can do some shipping? Or do you adjust the, the you know, the weight volumes on those barges to help accommodate the, the height in the rivers? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we are told by the barge lines how deep to load the drafts on the barges. And by that, that determines how deep we basically push the barge down into the river. Most times, uh, this time of the year, when the river is pretty well full of water, we'll load 11 to 11 foot 6 inch drafts. That means we're pushing the barge that far down into the river with green. In the summer, when the river levels tend to be a little bit shallower, that backs off to maybe 9 or 9, nine foot 6 inches. Um, there's um, 18 tons on every inch. Um, so yeah, it makes a big difference. You can go from loading a 75,000 bushel barge to back when we were having the low river uh, system last summer, we were only putting maybe 50,000 bushels on a barge or even 45,000. Um, it didn't get to the point where we quit shipping. They had problems on the Mississippi, but they kept dredging every day and tried to keep the river channels open as much as they could. But it was taking a lot more bush barges to move the same amount of grain with those lower draft limits. Okay. Wow. That's a lot of stuff uh, for everybody to keep track of and to keep it moving forward. That sounds like it's a pretty complicated job. I think we're watching Doug right now move. I'm not sure where he's going to. Uh, Doug, where are you moving to right now? Uh, just walking throughout the facility. We're going over to one of our pits where we would dump generic soybeans and okay. we're not dumping them today. And there's no trucks here, unfortunately, but this is where we dump them. They would then go up our leg and hit one of our conveyors and spouts, and then it would go to the designated bin that it needs to go to. Okay. So as you guys are shipping um, grain from Riverside down uh, to eventually um, New Orleans and then eventually somewhere else, what is one of the, the main areas, Mike, that soybeans are being shipped to around the world? What are some of those main areas? Uh, so, yeah, so from a soybean perspective, um, you would figure, you know, and again, these are these are rough numbers just so folks can keep them in their head. Uh, you're going to look and say that, you know what, about half the soybeans that are produced uh, in the U.S. by American producers are going to be shipped abroad or exported out. Um, probably 65 to 75 percent of that in any given year is shipped through the port uh, down in New Orleans. Uh, the rest of it uh, we'll go through various ports. The other big one would be up in the Pacific Northwest, just outside of Portland uh, for that. Uh, our number one consumer is China. Uh, they probably take, you know, just a little over half to almost two thirds, depending on the year of most of those exportable beans as well. So, um, and, and our beans don't supply them fully. Uh, they actually get another 
a large amount of soybeans from Brazil, who's another uh, country that does do a large amount of agricultural products that we have uh, when you look at it. But uh, soybeans in general, when you think of it, they're going to uh, Pacific Rim countries. So we did name China, Japan, uh, Korea is another, South Korea is another one uh, where they go to. Uh, then a lot of times it's our neighbors uh, down south. Uh, Mexico is one of the main folks uh, that also purchase our soybeans, uh, as well as some of the other uh, kind of Latin and uh, uh, Latin American countries that there are. Uh, we do have a little bit of business that goes over into the Mideast, uh, but for the most part, the, the big, big, big majority of them uh, goes to, again, that Pacific Rim. Uh, think China, think Japan, think South Korea, uh, even Vietnam pops into that a little bit here as well. So those are our main destinations for it. And, and that's one of the things that I think from at least my perspective and a lot of my fellow colleagues that is so neat about uh, the ag business and, and specifically the exportable ag business that CGB sits within is that we're able to take a farmer um, from Ohio and literally connect them with people that are going to use their crops from around the world. And, you know, we can set up that end user in an Asian country basically with a producer in Ohio. And, you know, that's one of the things that CGB prides itself on is We've got the, um, I'd say the wherewithal to make sure that all those little checkpoints along the way that it takes to get uh, soybean or really any ag product from point A to point B, uh, we have all that. And I think that's one of the neat things that we do. And I think that, you know, especially from an Ohio agriculture perspective is really, really neat um, that we're able to, to do and execute along those lines. Well, it sounds like Ohio soybeans are uh, really making a big trip. And if I remember, my friend uh, Tom Fontana t always tells us that one out of every three rows leaves Ohio and goes somewhere else. Is that right, Tom? Uh, that's correct. Actually, one out of every three go to China. So oh. uh, about 50 percent or give or take are exported uh, of our soybeans and about half of those uh go to China every year. And the reason they go to China is China has a lot of people. Uh, their standard of living in general has, in, has improved over the years. And the two major parts of a soybean are the meal or protein and oil. And when people have a little more disposable income, they want to eat uh, meat products and chickens and pigs are fed their protein that comes from soybean meal. So that's why so many soybeans go to China. That's really awesome. Um, one of the things that I was curious about, um, we have a question from Tippecanoe New High School. Uh, they're curious about in the process of transportation. So from Ohio Farms through your Riverside um, facility to the New Orleans port or the Pacific Northwest port, you know, and beyond, what are some of the programs that are in place currently that help to decrease uh, carbon footprint association just associated with transportation in general? Sure. No, that's a great question. I think caring for our environment and the future of, you know, not only us and our children is, is really important. I think, you know, even worldwide, we're working towards that with the advent of uh, different technologies and things that um, probably move to a lesser reliance on fossil fuels and things. Um, so one of the, the best parts about the U.S. ag industry as a whole is we use really big containers. And, and that's one of the keys to solving that is um, when you think about it, and, and I think we do have a chart that may show some of this energy efficiency, Heather, too, um, when we get a chance. But, you know, of, of the things that we've talked about so far, the, you know, the truck that may come from the farm, uh, the train, uh, rail car, and then the barge, <laughs> the barge by far is the most fuel efficient. Um, as we talked about, uh, or as Doug mentioned, not only do, do we get, you know, anywhere from 50 to 75, and, you know, again, those are good rule of thumb numbers onto a, you know, 75 trucks onto a barge, for example. Um, those are then strung together, those barges, you know, 15 deep on the Ohio, as long as the river conditions allow for it, you'll go 40 once you hit the Mississippi many times. Uh, so again, and that's just one boat kind of pushing that tonnage of grain. So it does become very efficient, even though it may be not the most up-to-date technology, so to speak. It is very, very efficient. Um, I've seen some data that says, you know, all of us driving to the supermarket, you know, the two or three miles from our house to the supermarket 
is probably three or four times more carbon intensive than, you know, getting, you know, some of these products from, say, uh, you know, Cincinnati down to the Gulf of Mexico. So, it, it, you know, again, the technology may not be exactly where we all want it, but at the same time, it is, uh, I think it's just a fantastic job of using size and uh, the, you know, the ability of what we do have to kind of minimize a lot of that footprint where we can and get it really from where food is grown to where it's needed around the globe. Yeah, I think that that's a really great point. I also think it's a really good point to talk about uh, grain in general, you know, as farmers uh, plant and grow crops, of course, they're taking in carbon from the atmosphere for that photosynthetic process. And so they're just a natural harbor of uh, carbon as well. So, um, you know, by yeah. moving that grain in a large capacity, like you're discussing, as well as the plants taking in carbon every year, you know, farmers are really some of our best carbon stewards that we have um, in industry without, you know, throughout the world. So that's that's an awesome question. We have, um, you know, a lot of variability in jobs that I see here, you know, from, um, you know, I think Scott, you said earlier, everybody eats. So you'll always have a great job available in ag. So um, I'm not sure where Doug is right now. It looks like he's still out. Where are you at, Doug? I'm out here at one of the pits. We just dumped the truck and now he's getting ready to weigh out and get his bill of lading ticket. Okay, good. So that that person who delivered that grain to the facility has now got weighed out. So basically, what you're saying is it's the it's the um, the difference between the weight of the truck and then a full truck, right? And so that'll be the weight of his uh, crop as he's going out, and what eventually they'll get paid for as they leave your facility. Um, so he'll go back potentially, or she'll go back and and get some additional grain and bring it uh, today or another day, you know, to be transported somewhere else around the world. So I think it's really cool, like when we're thinking about the different uses of soybeans and how they get all around the world as well. Um, we do have another question here, uh, excuse me, from um, Kevin from Bolton Agro STEM High School. Uh, they, you know, we already discussed about the water levels, but they were really concerned about last year's water level. I heard Scott say that it increased that uh, that rate up two thousand to three thousand times, kind of like that normal rate. And so we saw the cost of uh, movement increase dramatically. So the farmers, um, you know, how did that affect everybody in general? How will that affect consumers? Is their question? You know, as that water level is going down and those transportation costs increase you know, how will that impact eventually people that are purchasing food? Sure. Yeah, obviously, I think, go okay, ahead, Mark. Some of that is probably getting to be in the rearview mirror a little bit, um, mm -hmm. meaning that was kind of a last summer and a last fall uh, type of thing. And what it does is you're absolutely right. It increases the cost. How does it increase the cost? Well, we just talked about um, the strength of the barge industry is really the quantity that it can move. When you have the rivers shrinking, and I think we all saw pictures on the nightly news or wherever um, that, you know, especially around the Memphis area, I mean, you could see, you know, what looked to be not just a few feet of kind of sandbar or the river's edge, but what looked to be hundreds of feet or hundreds of yards at times um, with that. So what that ultimately meant was that uh, as Scott pointed out, the first thing is you can't load a barge as deep, so you can't maximize the amount of grain going into that barge. So then it just takes more barges to move the same grain. And you also can't put them, at, as we call it, a tow, you know, behind one boat. Instead of, you know, maybe 40 on the Mississippi, they're just running what they call one line. So there's just maybe, you know, five or eight barges deep in a single row, just so that way they can fit down the channel that's been created to, to make it there. Now, I think the good news is, is that the way the Mississippi River is set up, it sounds like it, we're always going to have one channel unless it's, you know, a really, really catastrophic uh, drought that happens. Um, but like most things, it's, you know, it, it's time of getting things down there. So as you can imagine, you're trying to move things somewhat quickly. But boy, it's, you know, you're working at 20, 30 percent capacity. Um, when you start doing that, costs go up, et cetera. So, you know, all of a sudden, the cost of you know, as, as Tom had mentioned earlier, uh, to maybe the end user in China that is maybe a soybean crush plant over there that wants that whole bean, and they're going to crush it to make the meal for their hog or chicken industry over there, uh, and then maybe have some of that oil that they can sell often for human consumption, uh, their cost is going to go up and the consumers would uh, ultimately pay for it. Um, but like I said, what's, what's interesting is, and as Scott and I know, sitting uh, you know, in uh, Southern Ohio in the Cincinnati area, uh, we're expected to get two or three inches of rain probably tomorrow. And actually we're moving to a flood stage if that were to happen overnight. 
And I would see, you know, the Ohio for sure is pretty well patched up, I would say, at this point in time. So we are definitely not worried about low water. Uh, and as that kind of hooks around the corner, uh, you know, at Kentucky and Missouri there, uh, it's going to start to uh, refill the Mississippi River, which has already been on the upswing here. So, again, I think most of those problems are behind us. It was short term. It did raise prices. But uh, that, is, that is kind of what we're looking at right now, Heather. Well, that makes me curious. Uh, Rita Mc McMillan has a question about what dangers are associated with transporting agricultural products, you know, via river or rail. And so you just mentioned a flood stage. And so do you have to take some extra precautions? Because I think that water moves a little faster in a flood stage. Is that right? Yeah, it absolutely does. And, and you know, maybe Doug or Scott's a little better to, to answer this question. And, and Doug, I'll probably turn to you. But you know, the first thing that we at CGB believe is those of us that show up to work, right, we, we want them going home in the same condition. And as you mentioned, sometimes these things can be a little bit dangerous with the equipment and uh, the areas that we do operate within. Um, so, Doug, maybe take some of the, if you don't mind, maybe just explain a, a couple of the processes that you guys have to go through that uh, is either a little bit different or maybe you have to do it a little bit slower uh, when the river moves towards this flood stage that we have upcoming here. I think you're on mute, Doug. I'll jump in while he, oh, there he's off. Oh, there he goes. We can right, hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep. Yes. Like I said, uh, when the water comes up, safety is the biggest thing for us. So when there's water moving a lot faster, the current's pushing the barges around, there's trees going up and down the river. It just takes more time and you have to work slower, work together. We have a mentor program where you work with someone so that we're teaching and coaching and taking care of each other, because that's our big, biggest thing here. Well, and I see that right now you have some safety equipment on yourself. So, I mean, you're obviously uh, got some coloration on there so that you're easily noticeable. You have a hard hat on, some safety. It looks even like a light, you know, if you're, you happen to be in a dark space. So it looks like you guys take, ser um, take your safety very seriously there as well. So 100%. Um, we, yeah, we do have one more question. Um, uh, that are coming in. We just now have a few questions. They're curious about, uh, do you hold grain or do you sell it pretty quickly? So, you know, at what point do you sell the grain um, and do you insure it, you know, in your process as it moves through your system? Our facilities are pretty much built for, um, you might use the phrase turn and burn. We don't mm -hmm. have tons of storage available. And with the amount of grain we receive, it's pretty much in and out. Um, We'll usually fill all these bins in late November to December, and then it's a matter of just continuing to ship to, to be able to continue to receive. Um, and it's the same at the Zeno export facility in the Gulf. They're not, that facility is not built to store grain. It's uh, built to load grain. So there's a lot of times when grain that's coming in a day is going straight to a barge. It doesn't necessarily even go through one of the silos. It can hit a belt and go straight to the river too. So it's pretty much once we're full, uh, we're, sh we're uh, shipping as much as we're receiving to be able to stay open. I think that's went fantastic. Um, you know, I'm looking behind you, Doug, right now, and I see these huge bins. So for a student, they might think, well, gosh, you know, that grain could last us for a really long time. But what it sounds like to me is that it's pretty much transported immediately throughout the world um, and that that grain is being consumed worldwide by livestock, by humans, or being used and made into really good products as well. Um, we do have another question um, from Colonel Crawford High School. They're curious um, what you think the grain market market looks like over the next five years. So at CGB and Zeno, how are you preparing for um, just the, the potential grain market as it comes on? Are you building new infrastructure? Um, you know, what are some of the plans that you have in the future? Sure. So I, I know personally, one of the things I love about working for CGB is that we are a growing company, um, kind of year in and year out. And we, we think the Outlook for the future in just the food space in general is very good, very rosy, very robust. Um, you know, the first thing you would look at is just general population growth. This Earlier this year, uh, we passed 8 billion people on Earth. And, you know, I think the really neat thing when you think about what we do is so, so many times um, we hear the discussion, the, the water trade. You know, this is what's important. How do we get water from places where it is to places where it's not? Um, well, this is 
in my mind, kind of the water trade, if you will. So a lot of the countries that we mentioned that are top destinations for uh, our exports are either places where there isn't a lot of arable land, which is land that can be farmed uh, to produce their own food. Uh, we're able to do that here in excess. We're blessed with one of the best um, in, you know, farming destinations in the world here in, in the central Midwest in the U.S. Uh, we're able to move that out and about. So uh, I, I think to me, that's, that's a really key thing that we want to look at uh, from that perspective. And, and Scott, I think in, in broad strokes said it best too, everybody wants to and really needs to eat ultimately at the end of the day. So, you know, I think those are some big broad brushes, uh, getting a little bit more down from the macro level to the micro level. Uh, it's one of those where uh, when you think of inflation that's hit our economy pretty hard over the last, you know, maybe 12 to 18 months or so, uh, that looks to be at least step, taking a step back. Uh, commodities do have a very high correlation with inflation. Uh, so while we were at almost record high prices uh, for the last couple of years, uh, there may be a little bit of a setback to that. And again, I think that is probably okay because they're still generally higher prices than I would say normal. So that will keep the producer uh, of our agriculture projects in probably pretty good shape, uh, but it also may bring a little bit of relief to consumers both here domestically in the U.S and potentially around the world. So there's always that fine balance that we run of uh, making sure that the folks that feed us each and every day, our U.S. producers, are well taken care of and they want to come back and do their job day after day because it's critically, critically important that they do that. Um, yet at the same time, there's also uh, something that we can probably all feel in our pocketbook, which is making sure that we're all able to put food on the table and do the things we want to do with our family. And uh, I think, you know, the last couple of years, um, and, and probably the next couple of years moving forward, it's going to be a great balance to uh, both those, uh, both the, the producer and the end user of commodities in general, especially foodstuffs. Um, well, thank you guys very much. We're kind of coming to a close here today, but I do have a question for each of you because you all really thoroughly seem to enjoy the jobs that you have. So Doug, Scott, and Mike, uh, can you tell us, you know, what's the, what's your favorite part about working in agriculture? You know, why do you encourage other people to, to jump into agriculture as a future career? I'd say a big part of it for me is family. Families mm -hmm. are all involved with this. So we get your employees around here. You spend a lot of time with them. You get pretty close with them. So that's one of my favorite parts about it. Thank you. Scott? Yeah, I think for me, it's uh, having the ability to uh, work with farm customers, um, build relationships. I mean, uh, this is a very relationship-oriented business that we're in. And so you almost uh, have a seat at the producer's table on helping them with marketing plans and delivery plans and that type of stuff. So I think we take pride in the fact of we're heavily involved with the individual producers we buy from and uh, trying to make them succeed because if they succeed, CGB will succeed. Thank you. And Mike? Yeah, I mean, to me, I'd probably echo both what Scott and Doug mentioned. One, uh, if, if somebody's never been in the agriculture industry or world, um, especially the producer side of it, man, what a cool and great group of folks. I mean, it is just unlike any other industry uh, from that standpoint. Um, so that's really neat. Then when you move inside, you know, maybe the commercial side of the business, like where CGB and some of our competition sits, uh, we ultimately have to take that reflection that our producers have, that it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of family-like, it's fun, but yet it's growing. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, to me, it's the fact that we get to interact with a great group of folks from our producers. Uh, internally, we get to interact with a great group of people. And it's a fairly steady job that has meaning at the end of the day. I mean, you are literally feeding you know, not only folks in the U.S. and your neighbors, but folks around the world. And it's really interesting to see how that gets done. Um, and especially somebody that didn't come from an ag background would say, boy, something just pops out of the ground here in Ohio and it can get moved and scooted wherever it needs to around the world. And, and watching all the pieces that, that need to happen to make that work. Boy, that is something that I'll just never probably get past. And, you know, I've been doing this for 20 some years and it just continues to be a fun adventure with uh, some regularity, but always something new each day. Well, it sounds like a uh, job in agriculture is the way to go. <laughs> hey, we Tom, so. as we 
Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you guys so much for being a part of everything with us today. I really enjoyed watching how grain moves from the farm uh, to your facility. And then again, to other areas like the Pacific North Rim that we talked about earlier, China or Japan, et cetera. It's really cool to think that soybeans that we grow here on my farm may someday end up in a different country. So um, it's just kind of surreal, really. So Tom wanted to thank you very much for um, helping to support this today and Ohio Soybean Farmers. Um, it's a really wonderful thing that we're doing for students to let them get out of their classrooms and see um, how the industry works. Is there any final things or thoughts that you would like to say, Mr. Fontana? I would just say that uh, thank you, Heather, Doug, Scott, and Mike very much. Uh, the people behind the scenes for putting this on, on behalf of all our soybean farmers in Ohio, we're really proud to be able to do this kind of educational activity. Thanks everybody for participating today and grow to go to grownextgen.org for more educational materials and things that teachers and students can use every day to learn about our business. So thanks everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.